thanks everybody for, for joining us this afternoon. I'm extremely excited to participate in the uh, last event for the week with PAR Motivations in our virtual series. First thing I want to do is thank a couple of people that have made this possible. Uh, working with LFA over the past couple of years, uh, we've been able to do some things and advance the program in more ways I think many of us thought we would be able to do in the short amount of time that we've been doing it. Uh, when COVID had happened in March, it kind of put everything on pause, but due to some, um, <clears throat> some, some ingenuity and uh, some adapting to the current circumstances and the situation, our team led by uh, Ben and his folks with the marketing and the developing of how we were going to actually push this out virtually has really taken away and helped us you know, continue our efforts uh, with LFA. So first, thanks to Ben and his team. Uh, Chad Mintz and uh, SJ Barry Hill for all the work they've done in making this as successful and continuing to make it as success as it is. The second thing I want, second people I want to uh, thank is um, Elizabeth City State University for continuing to think about LFA and what we're doing and hoping to bring the programs together so that we can maximize our outreach. So thanks to Elizabeth City State University for, for, for doing what they're doing and uh, Mr. Gooden out there with this program and uh, moving moving things along nicely up in the uh, up in North Carolina in that area, I'm excited to be here. Uh, when I first started doing PAR motivations uh, many years ago, the two of the people that have been the most supportive have been uh, well, one of them has been my brother, um, not directly a pilot, but he works in the aviation industry via the things that he's done and, and what he's been able to do over the past couple of years. So I'm excited that he's actually, you know, going to be able to share his story. Um, knowing him literally his entire life, uh, from, the, from the womb to the tomb, as they say, uh, I'm excited to be able to share this opportunity and have him share his story because I, I know what he's gone through to get where, he, where he's been, and it truly is inspirational. So um, when Elizabeth City State asked about doing the drone program, he immediately came to mind, as well as some of our excellent speakers this week. Uh, Lieutenant Haynes had a phenomenal brief on Monday. Uh, followed very closely with uh, um, uh, Major Swint and his brief on Tuesday. Tamel took us uh, took us home with his brief on videography from the drone perspective yesterday in 107 operations or Part 107 operations. Um, so definitely excited to introduce uh, Anson as our next speaker for and our last speaker for the week as part of the drone uh, drone experience academy at the Elizabeth City State University. Anson went to North Carolina a and full HBCU program. Um, and uh, graduated there and has been doing great things within the DOD community, specifically with Aerostats. Uh, for those of you that are watching that have, de that have deployed, if you're not overly familiar with that program, um, that is what is part of the, the, the base security that keeps us safe at night uh, during the day. I guarantee you somebody watching this has been um, uh, saved either once a one-off situation or just preventing an attack from the operations they do with the Aerostat, Aerostat program and the drone technology that integrate with that. So uh, without further ado, I just want to give Anson an opportunity to share his story and then uh, answer any questions that might come from a different aspect of what drones are and the te technology behind that ISR platform. So without further ado, Anson, you have the floor, brother. Uh, appreciate it, sir. Uh, Lieutenant Colonel Aaron Jones. Um, first of all, I just want to say this is my first time doing a Zoom meeting. Uh, we typically don't do this at work because it's not authorized on a DOD scale. So uh, forgive me for any uh, technical difficulties that I may encounter. Uh, hopefully, uh, Lieutenant Omni can get me squared away. Um, secondly, this is probably the first time I've put on anything other than a T-shirt or, or an A-shirt uh, in the last three months since I've been working from home. So. Um, it's kind of exciting to get dressed up or semi-dressed up. I normally wear a shirt and tie to work, so it's uh, breaking the norm. Uh, Got to represent the Aggies, but uh, a lot of love for Elizabeth City State University, a fellow HBCU, so uh, I tip my hat to you all. Um, let me close the door right quick. Sorry about that. My kids are waking up. Um, so... I'll get started with my PowerPoint, and, and while I'm while I'm indulging in it, uh, I'll uh, speak a little bit about myself and, and whatnot. So, um, let me just go ahead and get this squared away. Like I said, forgive me for one second. Uh, hold on. There we go. 
Nope, that's not it. Maybe. All right, so um, just skip to the next slide here. Part motivations. I got uh, the template from uh, my my family. So uh, here is just quick snapshot of a, a arrow stat. Nice picture we took. Uh, we were more down for weather, lightning strike in the background, just to give some hindsight over uh, what what it was that we were taking a picture of. It was a time lapse video. Um, in this picture specifically, we were supporting DHS or uh, Customs and Border Protection. Um, weather down there can get pretty intense at times, and uh, it rains it rains quite quite a bit during time, certain times of the year. So uh, we set up a camera and just started taking pictures and video, or taking videos, and we happened to catch this lightning strike that happened right behind the pad. As you see right there, that's the tail of the aerostat, or what we call the empennage. So, um, I guess essentially when Aaron came, first came to me, he told me that we were, we were doing high school students, we were working with high school students, so uh, I've never had a chance to speak to, to a high school students, but one of the things that, you know, people tend to ask us as, as freshmen or sophomores, even juniors and seniors in high school is, what do you want to be when you grow up? And, you know, typically the answers are doctors, lawyers. You know, movie stars or uh, other professional uh, uh, professions that typically don't, or cli as cliches go, come to mind: cops, firefighters, so on and so forth. But some of us don't know. Um, I didn't know what I wanted to do. I tip my hat to my brother uh, because he's always known what he wanted to do when he was uh, coming up, and he always wanted to be a fighter pilot in the United States Air Force. And he actually started working on his goal about uh, about sixth or seventh grade. Uh, me, on the other hand, I thought I was going to be a professional athlete, which uh, a lot of kids these days think they can do. Um, and as you get older, you realize that it's a little bit more difficult than you think it is. So with that being said, as I graduated, I, as I moved through high school or whatever and graduated, I really didn't know what I wanted to do. I real, realized my senior year of high school that I wasn't good enough to be um, a professional player, let alone a collegiate player. So uh, I just knew I wanted to go to college. So I just enrolled in school. and, and um, as general education, or uh, yeah, general education, just figured out, I'd figure out something along the way. And to be honest with you, uh, many people still don't know what they want to be. Um, I'm 38 years old and I love my career. I love what I do. I love supporting the warfighter, but uh, there's times I wonder if this is still something I want to do. Um, I would easily pick another career if I was younger, maybe something a little bit more entertaining or uh, what's the word, adrenaline, more of a adrenaline rush. Uh, maybe some kind of special forces or what have you, or maybe even police or or firefighter. Um, but I'm content now. My knees are bad. My back hurts all the time. So I figure right now where I'm at is is is, is pretty good. It pays the bills, and I do enjoy it. Um, so I, I I pass the next question is uh, to the next bullet. I would ask is there anyone that can name any types of aviation careers? Uh, feel free to. Shoot, shoot them to uh, on online or type them in or whatever, and um, Lieutenant Army will, will let us know. And then secondly, um, have you ever thought about a career in aviation? Um, I certainly did. Uh, unfortunately, it was after I had already spent my time in the military. I got deployed or what have you, and I came back and kind of admired my brother for a little bit uh, and what he was doing, what he was accomplishing. And by the time I graduated, I figured, you know, maybe I'll give it, I'll give it a shot. But uh, obviously, I didn't go down the path of aviation, so to speak, uh, but ultimately ended up in the career of some form of aviation. Like our program is 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 governed by the FAA, which is the Federal Aviation Authority. Correct me if I'm wrong, uh, Lieutenant Colonel Jones, but um, they still give insight over what we can do, how we operate. Uh, we still have to check in with them. We still have to get the, the NOTAMs, which is a notice to airmen, so they know where we're flying and how high we're flying and, and things of that extent, especially stateside. OCONUS or uh, overseas, rather, in deployed areas like the Middle East or Africa or even in, in um, the Asian area, Asian countries, we still abide by local FAAs, but they're a little bit more lenient. So um, nonetheless, we still kind of cater to the FAA, and they definitely provide governance over us. 
So again, if you've ever thought about a career in aviation, uh, feel free to chime in and let Lieutenant Omni know how you feel about it. And uh, the whole point of this is to try to gear gear you towards considering it in some form or fashion. Like everybody doesn't have to be a pilot. Um, you still need people to maintain the planes. You still need people to feel, feel the planes. You still need people to um, shoot the weapons as uh, those in the fighter pilot community will attest to, people to load, so on and so forth. So there's multiple fields in the aviation field uh, that you can partake in and still get a good knowledge and uh, understanding of what goes on uh, while flying uh, aircraft. So this particular slide I, I wanted to keep in um, primarily because it, it, it shows my uglier twin brother who has been a huge motivation to me. Uh, like he said, you know, we've known each other from the womb to the tomb, right? So um, he's been a lot more astute when it comes to different things throughout life. And I've, he's, he, he, he pretty much researched things and, and figured out how not to do the right things, where I learned how not to do the right things the hard way. So uh, uh, he's definitely a little bit um, more wise uh, when it comes to different aspects of life. And I, I kind of lean on him. So I figured this would be a, a good slide to show, especially since it shows a, a, a good depiction of the multiple faucets of uh, uh, flying or aviation that you can encounter, aside from drones and aerostats. So uh, a PAR event um, is pretty much what this kind of encounters, right? It's passion, attitude, responsibility was, a fine, uh, was founded primarily due to the uh, recognized lack of minority representation within the military and civilian pilot community. So uh, a lot of people may not know this, but um, minorities make up a very small percentage, and I don't know the exact numbers like uh, Aaron or Lieutenant Colonel Jones or, or uh, Lieutenant Omni would know, uh, but they make, make, they make up a very small percentage of the pilot community, not only in the Air Force, but commercially as well. So like your American Airlines, your Delta Airlines, US Airways, so on and so forth, like just uh, African Americans and, and, and Hispanics, uh, just they're just not seen as much as uh, um, white pilots are. Even even females are make up a, 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 a minute uh, majority of, of the pilot community. So um, this program is geared towards trying to engage people into understanding that just because you don't see people like you flying planes whether it's in the Air Force or whether it's commercially or working with aerostats or working with drones or things of that nature doesn't mean that you can't do it. So you can do whatever it is that you set your mind to, and this program is geared towards helping you see that and understanding it, and then also uh, helping you learn what you can do to pursue your, to pursue your dreams if you decided uh, aviation is something that you want to um, indulge in. So one thing I try not to do is read from the slides. Uh, so I'll leave it up there for a little bit. Y'all can read from it. Um, typically, all I want to do is um, just use them as bullet points so that I can I can speak to it. So if I'm moving too fast, by all means, let Lieutenant Army know, and uh, he'll let me know to slow down. So who am I? Uh, my name is Anson Jones. Um, I'm currently a senior operations and training specialist for a company called QED Systems, LLC. Uh, the company has been around for some time. I'm actually a contractor, but I work directly for the Department of Defense, uh, specifically the U.S. Army. And one of the programs that I work on is uh, Aerostat. So essentially where Aerostat, well, I'll get to that in a second. But um, so I come from a uh, military family. Uh, I have roots all over. I've lived in multiple states growing up, uh, uh, two different countries. Uh, but I currently reside. Uh, in Aberdeen, Maryland, and I grew up right down the street in a, in a city called Jessup. So, uh, one of the things I said you know, uh, uh, as I went through college was that I would never, I would never move back to Maryland. Um, Maryland's cost of living is pretty, pretty high. And uh, after living in North Carolina for a couple of years, I decided that, you know, that's something I didn't want to do again. But ultimately, uh, the path that I took uh, led me back here. So, I'm currently a contractor at Aberdeen Proof Ground. So, what have I done with the program? Um, I've been working with Aerostats for about 10 years now. Um, 
started out as an operator back in 2010 or well, late 2010, went through training, deployed to Afghanistan as an operator in Afghanistan. Um, I was there, I was in Afghanistan for a little over, little under a, a year and a half, about, about 17, 16 and a half, 17 months, um, providing support to the warfighter. Uh, one of the things that our program is geared, to, gear, is geared towards is uh, ISR, which if you don't know is intelligence, surveillance, and re reconnaissance. So typically we would launch our aerostat, do some data, data collection, um, um, patterns of life, things of that nature, and we'd give it back to the powers that be, and they would decide what they wanted to do with the information and how to disseminate it. Uh, pretty much like Aaron said before, or Lieutenant, Lieutenant Colonel Jones said before, uh, our program was very important because it provides a, a, a safety net, a sense of security for the individuals on the ground that are actually doing the um, troops in contact, the shooting, the fighting, or whatever. We let them know what's, what's around the corner in some instances or where there's an IED or things of that nature so they can try to protect themselves better and, and, and maneuver appropriately to avoid any uh, danger to life or limb. So. What I've done with the program, uh, I started out as an operator, became a trainer. Um, contracting is a dog eat dog world. Um, I hate to say this, but there's no loyalty in contracting, uh, contracting because everybody wants a piece of the pie. Um, you get a contract with the government, you know, you can pretty much pave your own uh, own way forward. So it's something to consider as well. Like, hey, look, I, I don't necessarily want to you know, work with somebody, I want to be my own boss. Well, there's avenues to go where you can get a contract with the government, but that's for a later date. We're here to talk to, talk about aviation. Um, so I say that to say that while I was working on a project in Texas with Border Patrol, uh, we lost a contract. Um, funding was cut and I ended up unemployed. And then the program office that I currently work for needed somebody with my skill set to, uh, Sorry, I'm still kind of on the clock. Um, somebody with my skill set to kind of gear them towards the right direction on what, what other avenues they can use for uh, providing aerial stats and surveillance. So I ended up working with, uh, ended up going to the acquisition field, um, which is what we do. We buy aerial stats for different programs or help other countries or other uh, agencies decide what type of aerial stats they need. So. Um, and I've been working, currently working with them for about six years now and slowly, I wouldn't say I've moved my way up, but uh, definitely contributed a little bit to uh, making sure that the right people have the right things. So why aerostats, right? Um, so I graduated from North Carolina A&T. Uh, after I was honorably discharged from, from the U, uh, United States Army Reserves back in 2008. And upon my graduation, I realized that I wanted to go into the Army. And unfortunately, I soon realized that uh, some of my disabilities that had me removed from the Army uh, prevented me from getting back into the Army. Um, as I said before, I kind of followed my brother a little bit and wanted to do something along the lines of what he was doing, but I didn't want to go to the Air Force. Felt like the army was the better uh, better choice for me, um, and so I wanted to go back in and be a helicopter pilot. And just unfortunately, things didn't, just didn't work out in my favor. So I ended up jobless for about a year and a half. And a friend of mine came to me and said, "Hey, look, uh, there's an opportunity to go overseas and work with the military. Uh, how do you feel about it?" I was like, eh, "I don't know, man. Last time I went to to the to the Middle East, things didn't really work out too good for me. Um, so after some thinking and realizing that I haven't had a job in a year and a half, and I said, you know what, let me go ahead and do it. So I ended up doing force protection uh, prior, or you know, base security for one of the military bases in, in, in the Middle East. And I was there for about a year or so, little, well, about a year and a half, and, and a friend of mine got a job doing um, work with aerostats, and he sent me the, the information and everything, and, Surprisingly, when I when I when I saw the first uh, offer, uh, the first contact, there was an email between the recruiter and another individual, and it was so poorly written, and his 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 grammar was terrible. Um, he just seemed, I'm not gonna say uneducated, but he seemed pretty ignorant. 
And so I applied. I was like, man, if this dude got a job with them, no, there's no way I won't get this job. So I applied, and they actually denied me the job the first go round. And this was like September, the September time frame. And um, I was like, well, that, don't, that doesn't make any sense. Like, you just pick somebody wild because he was in the Marines. I don't make, I don't get it. So about a month later, I reapplied, and um, they ended up taking me. And I decided, you know, okay, do I want to go to Afghanistan or do I want to go, do I want to stay here in, in Kuwait? Kuwait was definitely a better opportunity. The, the um, living conditions were pretty uh, lavish. Uh, we had freedom to go and come as we pleased, knowing that I was going to go to Afghanistan in a desolate and maybe austere environment. And for those who don't, don't know what austere means, it pretty much means isolated, hostile, people shooting at you, possibly um, no real toilets, no showers, things of that nature. So I decided, you know, was the money, was the money worth it? Was the juice worth the squeeze, so to speak? So I um, thought about it for a little bit, prayed on it. And then I ultimately I decided, you know what? I'm stuck here. I'm still away from my, my family, my son at the time. And uh, I decided, you know, I'll just go ahead, I'll just go ahead and hop up on it. So that's what I did. And, um, Fortunately, it, it got me to where, I, where I'm at now. So, of course, I kind of said some of this already. So I, um, I chose this career because I, I still wanted to give back to the warfighter, even though I couldn't join the military. Um, my mom was in the military. My brother's still in the military. My father was in the military. A lot of my family and friends are still in the military. So I decided, why not? Uh, if I can't get back into the military, then I'm 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 gonna try to support the best way I know how, and and that's the job that I chose was going back as a contractor. So going back into uh, 2011, when I first took this opportunity as an aerostat operator, I realized that this was this was the best way to give back. These aerostats provide a sense of security that I wish I had when I was deployed as a soldier back in 2003. Um, gives an opportunity to give for, uh, foresight of what's going on, what's going to happen next, what's around the corner. Uh, if there's nothing at all, at the very least, we know that they can see us and can possibly tell us what's going on and, and, and what turns to make or where to avoid. So it's definitely a plus. Um, but at the end of the day, I started this path because I needed to support my family. Um, Unemployment was running out. I was working at Chili's Bar and Grill with a college degree, making seven dollars and some change an hour. You know, handing out to go plates and coming in early in the morning and putting together rice and salads and ranch dressing. Um, just wasn't something I wanted to do. So I figured, at the very least, let me go over here, make a little bit of money, come back, and maybe get back on the right path. So went over there. I ended up being overseas for a little over three years between. Uh, Kuwait and Afghanistan and, and supporting the military the whole time. So that's something that I would never change for a little bit. Um, met my, uh, my wife over there. Uh, we ended up having two kids. So and then the two kids are things that wouldn't have happened otherwise. Um, I guess I don't know if I should say ex-wife or wife, but it doesn't matter. Um, so yeah, that's both of these is where my story began. So my journey. Started out at Florida A&M, another uh, HBCU. Um, tra ended up transferring to North Carolina a and and things were different. So my first year at a and I was actually homeless for about three months. And a lot of my family and friends don't know this. Um, essentially what happened was I had to validate my bill with some of y'all will find out about, and I didn't have enough money for uh, room and board and tuition. So I had to decide what I was going to do. And at this point in time, I was stern. I knew I wanted to get a college education. Um, I was actually uh, in ROTC to become an officer in the military. So I knew I just, I just needed to do something. So I decided to drop room and board from my, my bill and keep, uh, my classes so that's what I did and I slept on dorm rooms with a couple of my uh, military brothers uh, I slept on couches I slept in a van which is where I kept all my stuff and it was just a weird kind of thing and I didn't let it stop me 
Uh, I decided that that was what I was going to do. That was the choice I decided I, I needed to take. Um, could I have went home and stayed with my father? Yeah, absolutely I could have. But would I have been able to do, would I be where I'm at today? Probably not. Uh, I wanted to get away from the house. I, that's the best thing that I ever did was leave the state of Maryland for for school and, and work. Um, not mad that I'm back because I'm around family, but at the end of the day, there are a lot of people who don't leave where they're at because it's a comfort zone. And one of the best things I've learned over the years is that you have to get comfortable with being uncomfortable. And of course, it's uncomfortable being homeless. I, I, I've experienced times where I was jobless. I was uh, unemployed. Um, times were hard. I was hopeless, but you know, I still had to make sure that myself in the beginning had to eat. And then once I had my son, uh, of course, I had to make sure I took care of him. So uh, eventually I got on my feet uh, within that first semester. Uh, I was only uh, homeless for about half the semester. Uh, one of my uh, sisters from the uh, from the military, she decided, she found out what I was doing. She was like, hey, look, I've been trying to move to Greensboro anyway, find an apartment, and then me and you can be roommates. So we ended up doing that. And then uh, lo and behold, about three months after she moved in, we got deployed. Um, and then when I came back, when I came back, I had a son. So, you know, I had a little bit of money from being deployed and that kind of paved the way, got a job, worked there for a couple of years. I pretty much worked my entire time I was in college. So uh, I definitely did what I had to do to make sure that things were squared away for myself and my family. Um, and then once, like I said, once I graduated, I had to find another path to go on because the money was drying up. I ended up getting laid off from a particular job because of my disabilities. And then um, I had rental property that I lost all my tenants at the same time. So it was, it was a tough break, but I didn't give up which goes into my next bullet, the power of positivity and believing in yourself. You know, never give up. If there's a will, there's a way. So even though I lost all my funds at the same time, um, I didn't have a job. My unemployment ran out. I had lost both my tenants. So now I'm living in a house with three bedrooms by myself, knowing I could you know, rent out at least two of them. Um, the little bit of money I saved up quickly dwindled away. Uh, unemployment wasn't really working out to my to the best of my uh, my ability, um, so I just had to I had to figure out what I was going to do next. Took a temp job here and there, uh, worked at Chili's, like I said, and ultimately I ended up doing what I was doing, where I ended up in Kuwait, and that kind of led the way. So, as far as like my success and my failures go, these things didn't stop me. Um, I made a lot of sacrifices. So the biggest sacrifice I made was leaving my son, who was four years old at the time to go back overseas and not knowing how long I was going to be gone. And I distinctly remember one time I was in, I was in a, in the tower doing guard duty, um, protecting the base or what have you. And, and, you know, where I think we were about eight hours ahead at the time. So, and I was working night shift. So he called me and he said, uh, he was like five years old. And I, I really remember he said, Hey dad, you know, I miss you. Um, like, I miss you too, buddy. He was like, uh, I just want to let you know that I understand that, you know, you didn't want to leave. You didn't want to leave me, but you had to leave me because you want to make sure that I have everything I need and you wanted to take care of me and mommy. And I was like, well, I don't know who you heard that from because that's a lot coming from a five-year-old. But I was like, yeah, you're correct. That's right. I'll be home soon, so on and so forth. And it was at that time, I realized that everything I was doing was adding up to where I needed to go and what I, what I needed to be doing to make sure that everybody was taken care of. So it was definitely a good feeling to know that a five-year-old understood that. Um, but at the same time, it was kind of heartbreaking. Like, yeah, I didn't want to be away from him, especially at that time in his life, you know, missing the first day of school, first soccer practice, things of that nature. But I knew I, that's what I had to do. And ultimately, I ended up making more sacrifices as uh, I ended up getting married sometime later and, have, um, you know, providing for them and missing birthdays and holidays and, uh, having to trying to trying to plan a wedding from from Afghanistan, you know, like pretty much, I was like, she just planned everything. She planned everything. I paid for everything, and boy, I hated that. But you know, it, it is what it is. So, the sacrifices is definitely one thing that led to my success um, thus far. With kind of some of my failures too, but neither here nor there. So. Responsibility, owning up to your actions, situations, and not blaming others. Being homeless was something I chose to do. I don't blame anybody for that. I blame myself for that. 
Um, my twin brother, uh, Lieutenant Colonel Jones, he was uh, fortunate enough to have some idea of what he wanted to do, and he worked hard. And he, he, he continuously did everything that he needed to do to get where he wanted to go. And by doing so, um, when he graduated from the United States Air Force Academy, he had no student loans. And the little, debt, the little bit of debt that he did have was a, a loan that they afforded, uh, offered him while he was in school. And he took that loan and invested it. So by the time he graduated, he paid off the loan and still had money in his pocket. Whereas myself, uh, you know, I didn't really know what I wanted to do up until the last minute. And unfortunately, I'm still paying off some of my student loans. Um, not to say I would change anything else, but, you know, that's what comes with deciding to go to school and not having you know, done the, the preparation and taking care of things that you need to take care of prior to, to, to getting to school. Um, Mr. Vince, I chose to sacrifice certain events to be there later. So um, my, my, my two youngest kids, they're five and three. Uh, I haven't missed a day uh, or uh, an I haven't missed an important event yet. I still travel for work, so I still go overseas sometimes, uh, but I haven't missed a, a day yet with them. Um, I still I've been there for every birthday, every holiday, um, but that was a sacrifice I made with some of my older kids that, you know, I don't have to make that sacrifice with them now. And then the last thing is like, <clears throat> letting my disabilities dictate my drive. So, some of my, some of my disabilities are, none of them are physically seen, um, but there's some of them are physical, some of them are, are, are intuitional or mental or whatever the case may be. And, and there's days where I don't even want to get out of bed because either I'm too sore or I'm just mentally drained. And that's had an impact on my drive in the past. And it took me some time, probably about three, four years before I started getting all of that under control uh, from a physical aspect and a mental aspect. Um, and I just know that in order for me to continue down this path of success, I need to you know, fight through some of those quote unquote demons that I'm dealing with, whether it's my uh, physical um, physical pain or my mental pain, I need to kind of tuck that aside and just deal with what's going on right now so that I can move past that. And unfortunately, it's still something that I'm still working with. However, I've learned that I need to overcome those things so that I can move forward and, and, and accept the things that are going to come. Because ultimately, there's things that you, you can have a clear-cut path of what you want to do in life, but nothing's going to go as, as going to go the way that you want it to go. Um, and that's what family and friends are for. So the importance of a, a support structure, like we all need help at times. Um, when I was in Afghanistan, you know, uh, my wife at the time, she she, she decided that, uh, you know, if I didn't come home soon, she, she wanted a divorce. So I, I can quit my job, make sure I had something lined up, of course, and, and, I, and I came back home and did some months away. I was still working away from the family, uh, family and kids, whatever, but, um, Ultimately, I ended up where I'm at now, and the first year and a half I was stationed in, in Aberdeen Proving Ground, I actually lived with my father. I was 32, 33 years old. I owned, I owned two houses, but I wasn't living at either one of them. But at the same time, I couldn't afford to get my own place up here in order that I know uh, what tomorrow was going to bring, so I didn't want to uh, try to buy something up here. So I lived with my dad for two years as a 32-year-old, so until I was 34. Um, there was times throughout that period, throughout this whole period, where I needed to borrow money from my family, uh, my brother, uh, my mother, my father specifically. And I'm pretty certain I still owe Lieutenant Colonel Jones a couple thousand dollars, but I mean, from the womb to the tomb, so it doesn't really matter right now. Um, he'll get it back eventually. And so I just say, you know, as, there's always going to be a time where you need to rely on somebody, and the biggest lesson you can learn is to humble yourself, let go of your pride, and, and when you need help, know that you need help, and ask somebody for that help. And then at the very least, you know, you can pay it forward. So it's, it's, it's always an opportunity to, to receive help and then to give help. Um, and that was a hard lesson for me in the beginning. But then, hey, once I realized, hey, you know, I'm not too proud, I'm not too proud to beg, as TLC said, uh, it became not easier per se, but I was less reluctant to do it. I was less afraid of what people might think of me by doing so. So with that being said, you know, of course, paying it forward, there's three quotes I put down there. Um, one, of the, one of my favorites, uh, it was the first one, it's easier to build strong children than to repair broken men. And it kind of speaks for itself, right? You know, if we build each other up as young kids or we build our younger generation up to be, to grow into, 
to uh, fertile, fertile men and women and, and, and productive and profitable and entrepreneurs or whatever you want to call it or however you want to describe it, um, it's so much easier to do that than it is to repair somebody that's already been broken or through the system or has been neglected throughout their lives, right? So uh, a, a prime example is somebody, if you can keep somebody out of the system from going to jail as a young kid, they're less likely to go to jail as an adult, whereas if you got a, a, a young kid who goes, you know, goes into the system as a kid, uh, that that be uh, the behavior becomes repetitive. It's habitual. Like that's all they know how to do because they got a mark on them, so they're they're continuously trying to feed their family, but they're going on about it the wrong way. So it's important to take care of your community. Um, white, black, purple, yellow, green, it doesn't matter. <clears throat> the more we can realize that we need to do that, the better off we'll be. And so it kind of leads me into my next uh, the next quote. Uh, the man that does the things that count often does not to stop to count them. I'm sure in this in this uh, day and age, we've all seen these videos of people who are out there feeding the homeless or um, giving the giving giving the homeless money and you know doing these these community service acts, but they're recording themselves. Um, not to say that you know it's not good for people to see that because it's like oh well, if he did it, maybe I can do it too. But it's like, how would you feel if you were a homeless man on the corner, a homeless woman on the corner, and somebody came up to you and recorded them giving you shoes or giving you money, and then put your face and all that stuff all over the internet? I mean, you 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 already you're already worrying about a lot. Why else do you you know why would you why should you worry about somebody like using your face as an opportunity to become respected or uh, not famous, but you know, well known? I mean, you do things because you want to do them, not because you want people to, to see that you're doing them. So if you're doing the things that count, it doesn't matter if it's one, two, 10, 20 times, you're not going to stop the count and say, oh, well, I did this on this day or I did that on that day. Nah, you just keep doing, doing, doing God's work or doing whatever it is that you believe in and giving back to the community over and over and over again because that's what you want to do, not because you want to get credit for doing it. Couldn't tell you how many times I've given people money on the corner just because Hey, the spirit said, "Hey, give them a dollar." I'm not giving them a ten dollar bill, but I'll give them a dollar. Just kidding. Uh, I've off, I've offered to buy people uh, food. One guy even told me, "He's like, look, I don't want your money. I just want a beer." I was like, "Hey, well, come on. I want a beer too." So I went in the store, bought him and him and myself a beer, and you know, cheered him up. And then I went about my business. He went about his business. And then one of the other things, uh, the last quote that I think is pretty paramount to what's going on today from different aspects of our, our cultures is too often we're judged by, too often we judge other groups by their worst examples while judging ourselves by our best intentions. Um, and this plays a lot with the stereotypes that, are govern, that, that govern our, uh, our lives. Um, black people love watermelon, black people love chicken, black people always leave, white people smell like cheese, white people have good credit, whatever the case may be, like, we judge we judge people by based off stereotypes where stereotypes do exist for some kind of reason, but not necessarily true reasons. Like especially today and age, so it's like you gotta take into consideration. Like we can't judge a, a an entire group of people based off the worst stereotype, and then praising ourselves because our best intentions is to do good. So we're doing good, but we're judging an entire ethnicity or entire culture or entire uh, uh, race based off their worst examples. But we know that we mean well, so you know we're not going to judge ourselves, and we think that we're better than them. And that goes for you know people of the same race. Um, there's times where you know black people or white people think that they're better than other black people or white people. Um, so that's one of the reasons why I like this. And oh, by the way, President George Bush. Uh, of all people, um, I quote this from, and sometimes I get, you know, a, a third look when I when I uh, bring up this quote. So, moving on, aerostats and airships this is what I've been working on for the last ten years. So, an aerostat is a light an aircraft that gains its lift through the use of buoyant gas. In our in our particular field, we use we use helium helium because it's not non combustible and um, it does not uh, ignite. Uh, the Hindenburg, Hildenburg, Heidenberg, Heidenberg uh, was an uh, aerostat or airship, I'm sorry, from 
way back in the day, I think May May of 1930, somewhere in the 1930s, um, but it was filled with hydrogen. And hydrogen is ex extremely flammable, and there was a fire on board, and ultimately ended up uh, blowing up the entire the entire airship. Air, airship. So we use uh, helium gas now. It's not flammable, non combustible. Um, it still gives us the lift we need, even though hydrogen would be a a better component to giving us that lift. Um, helium is less volatile. It's safer, so that's what we use. And then aerostats include unpowered balloons and powered airships. So on the left hand side, you see uh, aerostats, and I believe looking at the field, that is actually the TCOM facility in Elizabeth City, North Carolina. So for those of you that live in North, uh, Elizabeth City, North Carolina, um, you're probably familiar with the uh, Coast Guard Station. Uh, if you drive a little further down, uh, probably about three or four miles further down, um, you'll actually come into TCOP's, um, sorry, TCOM's facility where they actually manufacture, uh, sell, and operate aerostats. And I'm sure some of you uh, in, Elizabeth, in Elizabeth City have actually seen these things flying and actually have, uh, Anybody else is on here from uh, New Jersey, Arizona, or, or even Texas, or New Mexico for that matter. Y'all may have seen them as well. Um, but TCOM is in Elizabeth City. They manufacture these. Uh, and like I said, I'm sure y'all probably seen them before. And then on the right hand side, you actually have an airship. So probably the most common known airship that y'all might be familiar with is the Goodyear Blimp. Um, it's still helium, uh, helium based, lighter than air. Uh, aircraft and it's actually uh, flown, whereas an aerostat is tethered, kind of like a, a balloon on a, a string. So we call it a kite. It's uh, tethered to a platform and that allows us to launch the aerostat into the uh, atmosphere, depending on where we're at, to a certain altitude, and actually it allows us to give some control and, and maintain uh, positive control over it, and then we'll, we'll cover the aerostat. Um, based off mission or situation, whether it just depends on what the what the current uh, conditions are. Um, aerostats come in multiple different sizes, shapes, um, and perform different missions. Uh, these are quite a few here. Um, the first one is a PTIDS. The first one that you saw is kind of fast. So I apologize. Uh, is a PTIDS that was manufactured and built by Lockheed Martin. Uh, the second one you saw was a TCOM aerostat. The round one, I cannot recall the company that actually made that one, but uh, as you can see, the first four, the other four are all kind of shaped like blimps with a tail, uh, and the, the, the fourth one is round, kind of like a, I mean, maybe a, a balloon or a UFO, uh, but they all serve their purposes. Some of them have uh, cameras on them, some of them have radars on them, some of them have other sensors on them, but it just depends on the mission and uh, the agency that's using it. Um, Border Patrol uses them now. They have different sensors on there. Uh, they use it to secure our border along the, uh, the southern border along Mexico. Um, there's this one right here is a pretty large, the one that's on screen right now is a pretty large one. It's been known to carry multiple equipment uh, and different sizes and weights. Um, the, the bigger the aerostat, of course, the more helium it goes into it, and ultimately the more weight that it can carry uh, above ground. So um, this one right here looks like a TARS aerostat, which would have anti-aircraft uh, radar on it, or aircraft radar on it, be able to detect low-flying aircraft. Um, they had some of these across the board as well, uh, both on the north and the south, uh, also used overseas. Uh, the one you saw on the ship was something used back in the day. Um, but they definitely served their purpose and we, we used them accordingly based off mission, uh, agency requirements, um, and things of that nature. They're pretty, pretty easy. They're pretty easy to launch and recover. Um, it's kind of just like using, like I said, like a kite, but it has a motor on it. So you launch it up using this motor, uh, uh, detach it from the mooring platform, put it up, let it sit up there for a couple of days at a time. Um, and then when you're done doing whatever you need to do or whatever the case may, may be, you just you bring it back in and you reset. 
uh, do everything else that you need to do. The complicated part behind aerostats is actually behind the scenes and it's using um, the IT side of, uh, of our, our field where we capture this data using different servers, um, uh, softwares, uh, command and control, just to be able to manipulate the camera or whatever data which we're using to to decide how we're going to capture the data for whoever they were capturing it for. So, <clears throat> excuse me. A lot of times it is video, but sometimes it's radar, and sometimes it's uh, yeah, sometimes it's radar, sometimes it's video. So, so um, if a if, if a, a career in aviation interests you or excites you. By all means, let the let the powers that be, uh, Lieutenant Colonel Jones or Lieutenant Army, know how you feel. Um, they have a lot of uh, events uh, pre-COVID that they do hands-on. Um, they do something in the summertime where you can actually learn to be a pilot, uh, get hours towards becoming a pilot. Um, and again, you can use. Like I said, being an aerostat operator is not as intense as being a pilot. There's still some things that you have to learn. You still have to come, have, have some kind of a work ethic and, and uh, education behind you. But nonetheless, it's, it's not as uh, stringent as uh, being a pilot. So. So one more video, uh, we're running short on time, so I'm gonna just play one more video. Um, this is a, a frat brother of mine uh, from North Carolina NT, who's also a pilot. Uh, him and my brother actually know each other. So, here we go. Give me one second, Aaron, or, yeah, all right. Two minutes and then we can just move on. Uh, Paul Lopez, F-22 Raptor pi fighter pilot, um, very astute individual, um, and has been de dedicated to flying for uh, years. I think at the time of this video, which might be two or three years old, he had been in the, in the Air Force for just about 12 years. So uh, without further ado, Paul Lopez, Aggie Pride. And you got to change the screen. It's still not showing the other one. Anson. Yes, sir. Yeah, once you pause that video, it's not coming across like it's like you want it to. So before we uh, just break off, I'm pretty sure everyone's seen Paul Lopez fly the F-22. Uh, he's a rock star in the making. Um, but I wanted to ask you a question and spend the next 10 minutes or so getting some questions from the room. Uh, I know you, you've been in the aerostat field for some time now. And what I'm looking for is seeing if you could share with us, one, what makes – 
the, the drone technology that's similarly used on the aerostats effective and you know, knowing that you've been in the field and been able to utilize this to, to, to execute the mission that's designed for, is there something you can share with us that's kind of been made it worthwhile for you to be able to, um, you know, associate yourself with the Aerostat program that keeps you going back for more? So what does the drone technology look like? How to utilize? And uh, can you share a story? So <clears throat> I guess I'd give one of my uh, two experiences in one. So, uh, like I said, I always wanted to give back to the military once I realized that I couldn't get back in. Uh, supporting the warfighter is one of, one of our, our models and something that we pride ourselves on doing. So um, with that being said, one of my first uh, duty stations when I was in Afghanistan was in the northwest uh, hemisphere of Afghanistan, uh, about 20 miles or so from uh, the Turkmenistan border. And... Um, it was uh, entertaining to see everything come to light. So when we first got to to the site, we hadn't set up yet, and um, we we're in the process of setting up. And this was at the time was one of the most austere or hostile sites in Afghanistan. And um, I just remember we was out, we were outside, and we were getting ready to set up. And all of a sudden, uh, our support element, uh, seventeen cab out of Fort Carson, Colorado. Uh, Mad love for them because without any hesitation, and we took a couple rounds, and before I knew it, all these soldiers were lined up on the HESCO just return, return and fire. And, um, you know, me being deployed before with a weapon was different now because now I'm deployed with no weapon, and, you know, I can't even do anything. I'm really just sitting duck hoping that these guys know what they're doing and can, and, and, and can aim. You know, in fact, uh, the, the shots the shots were coming in and going out so bad that I just went and got, I got my pillow. I went to our ground control station and I just opened the door, walked in, closed the door. And I walked on the, uh, walked to the front where our screens and stuff said, there's like a little desk and I laid on the floor and I just put the pillow down. I was like, I'm, I, I can't do this. I'm going to sleep or something. Cause one of them rounds come over there has to go the right way. That's my, that's I'm, I'm, I'm done. So, but, Couple of days later, once we got established and everything, we started realizing that uh, you know where the where the fire we 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 were we were providing intel to the to the unit of where where stuff was coming from, um, and we were able to help them establish a sense of security where they were um, able to re retaliate in a way that provided more protection for us, and also in doing so they realized that, you know, at first there's all who these contractors, what are they doing here? But then they realized that they had a security blanket when they were fly when we were flying. Um, if we were never, if we weren't flying, they didn't want to go on mission, you know, because like I said, when I was at that, when I was down range and having something like that in the air just provides that sense of security kind of provides you with that sense of comfort that you're going to be okay. At the very least, you're going to know before something happens, which gives you the advantage, right? So, um, that being said, too, is like it gave me an opportunity to actually live that life again as far as supporting the military. Like I lived with these guys. I breathed with them, ate with them, slept with them, um, so to speak. Uh, and my first sight, you know, one of my favorite stories to tell people is that, I mean, I didn't shower for 30 days. I couldn't shower. If it wasn't for baby wipes, I praise God, the huggies. And Pampers, if it wasn't for baby baby wipes and 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 uh, uh, from Huggies and Pampers, like I don't know what I would smell like. But it was definitely an experience that I'd ex I didn't think I would ever experience again. Not to say that everybody does experience, but it's definitely humbling and it's, it gives you a sense of life and realize that some of the things that you take for granted here in the states, and that's one of the biggest things that I learned was like you take for granted running water, um, a toilet that flushes. Like we were burning our feces downrange, you know. We had an outhouse, and every day somebody was in the in the in the pit, burning that stuff, dumping it over into into the hole, and then next day same thing. So um, that was one of my experiences as far as the drone technology goes. <clears throat> um, one of the things that I didn't really touch on too much, just because you know I'm trying to stay away from you know divulging information. I don't know if, you know should be out there or whatever, but. The information is that is out there is that you know 
aerostats and drones, they fly, they fly cameras. And that's one of the biggest uh, pluses when it comes to providing support for, for the military and, you know, uh, the civilians on the ground is giving them the opportunity to see what's out there, what's behind the corner or what's coming down the road or how your convoy is looking as you drive down the road and knowing that you have eyes in the sky that can tell you, hey, stop. There's an ID in the road, I IED in the middle of the road, things of that nature. Um, so the drone technology has been very beneficial. It's they're they're continue, continuously um, updating it, uh, providing cameras that can see further, um, drones and aerostats that can fly longer and higher um, and further. Uh, so it's, it's it's just aerostats are a vital component uh, to the drone industry because. They do what else uh, drones can't, and that's staying aloft um, for pennies to the dollar. Uh, we rely on gas like a vehicle does to to fly, just like drones do. But the way we operate, we can stay up for days at a time where a drone wants, you know, they, they use that fuel. We use gas. You know, we stay up for, you know, whatever amount of days we do, we need to stay up for. Drones, they stay up for, you know, two, four, five, six hours at a time. Then they got to come back and refuel. We have to refuel too, but we don't have to do it for a couple of days. So I think that's where the two kind of work together as far as providing that support and continue continue to grow to be beneficial to the warfighter. Over. Awesome. Uh, I appreciate it. I think, I think – uh... Air had to run. He just texted me. He had a he had a pull chalks there, but uh, at least from uh, from Facebook, I got a, a couple things for you. Uh, Mr. Carey says obviously he appreciates your your real world real world story uh, for his students, for all of us, and uh, your courage and endurance is inspiring. Great example to to follow and, and learn from, uh, and he, he really appreciated your uh, uh, your presentation. And uh, Mr. Gooden, who's with uh, Elizabeth City State University. Uh, says that your, your life journey provides a true message that pr proves that the path to success is not always an easy or smooth ride. Uh, and he says, next time that you're down there in Elizabeth City, uh, please stop by and, and, and visit the undergrad students. Um, so I can say for sure too that I, I absolutely uh, loved your, your, your presentation. I think more times than not, you know, especially even with, with our PAR events that we've got great stories and, 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 uh, and, and different people from different backgrounds, but the bottom line, for everybody is that you know it's never always milk honey and sunshine and, and a lot of times we just see the end product of where we are now and we, we all you know might be successful but how we got there uh, I think a lot of times especially when I was a lot younger uh, that I was never exposed to a lot of those those real truths of how a lot of people get to where they are today uh, so I did I appreciate it. I thought that was that was awesome it's a, it's a, a great story to go back to what you said before earlier as far as the, the stats 93% uh, of People in aviation today are, are Caucasian. Uh, out of that 90%, 6% are women, which is a very small minority. And about 2% is African-American. Uh, another 2% is, is uh, Asian or, or Latino. So really, as you mentioned, it, whether you're a female or a minority of any, of any demographic, that, yeah, it's, it's not, there's not a lot of us uh, out there uh, doing it. So. But then also that, uh, that number decreases uh, with the fighter pilot community as well. Yeah, so in, in my case and uh, in your brother's case, it's, I think it's like 1%, something like that. It's, it's an extremely small uh, number. It's, it's, it's so low that they, they group everybody, women, yeah. minorities, all into that 1%. Generally speaking, it, you know, at some point in time, we'll, we'll all rub elbows or we all know one another, at least through someone other, uh, you know, through one another, which is, is there, but you know, that's, that's why we're, we're here doing the things that we're doing to hope that we can inspire our, our kids and next generation. So, you know, by the time that we're older, that, you know, that the numbers will be better. There'll be better representation all around for, for everybody. And I, I think everybody would win. Uh, as far as uh, LFA, you know, you mentioned like eyes above the horizon and, and that was pre COVID stuff. What I think is really awesome is what's coming up Saturday. Uh, for those on Facebook that, that don't know, well, it's legacy flights across America. And what, we're doing because we can't do our normal eyes above the horizon event uh, due to COVID uh, is uh, going to be pretty much discovery flights, if you will. So kids will be going uh, on their, their first rides, if you will. And this is uh, all over the country. Five, five states will be live streaming. Uh, you can uh, go to the website, legacyflightacademy.org and, and see uh, 
uh, the link there to register. You can catch it on Facebook live as well. We'll be streaming it uh, everywhere. Uh, but it's one of those things that, you know, we're, we're trying to make things happen uh, despite the current events in the world that, that challenges us to, to keep doing this. So. And then Mr. Travers also says a great presentation as well, man. Thanks for sharing your story. Stops the uplifting and then it gives young folks encouragement. So there's, there's definitely people. And like I said, I know if there's probably people out there that enjoyed it as much as, as I did, that, that definitely take something away, away from that. So. Well, uh, I appreciate everything. Uh, I didn't mean to be so long winded. No. <laughs> Actually, I didn't think my uh, presentation was going to be that long, honestly. So uh, yeah, I definitely appreciate y'all having me. The beauty is in the details, and, and like I said, it, when it comes out like that, it's, it's awesome. And thankfully, like I said, we've had the time to, to make it happen. So uh, on behalf of Legacy Flight Academy, thank you uh, for doing this for us. I know that Elizabeth City State definitely appreciated that. So, well, I appreciate uh, Legacy Flight Academy more than uh, most people might know, uh, regardless of the fact that uh, Lieutenant Colonel Jones is my twin, but uh, what they stand for and what they're trying to do is awesome. Uh, Appreciate Elizabeth City State University, fellow HBCU, uh, Elizabeth City itself uh, allowing me the opportunity to come and speak. Um, it's actually a coincidence and a wonderful coincidence actually that, you know, I work with the OEM down there, TCOM, um, been down there a few times. So it, 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 it was a pleasure doing so. Uh, so again, I appreciate the opportunity and look forward to working with you all in the future. Yeah. So thank you all for uh, attending. I hope to see all you back here uh, on Saturday for Legacy Flights Across America. So without further ado, I'll catch you all later. Appreciate it. Thank you, sir. Yeah.